Hello. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Good. So yeah, I'm Stephen Hussey. Um, I'm happy to be here. I uh, was delighted to get an invite from Sally to speak. Um, I feel like I have an important message, and I'm, I'm glad to share it with you all. So we have a lot to go through, so we'll get started. So obviously today I'm talking about cardiac metabolism um, and this question of why heart cancer is so rare. Someone posed this question to me maybe like five years ago, and I thought, huh, it is pretty rare. You never really hear about heart cancer. Um, and when I thought about everything that I knew, I kind of looked into it and found some answers, and I'm going to share them with you today. So first, a little bit about me. Um, so at a very young age, I had a lot of inflammatory conditions. Uh, I had asthma, uh, diagnosed at age two. Um, I had lots of allergies, cats, grass, different foods, things like that. Um, I used to break out in chronic hives, uh, just huge hives all over my body. And the doctors couldn't really tell me why. Uh, all they knew how to do, or they all, the only thing they found that worked was to put me on prednisone, um, which you can see what happened when I went on prednisone over there. I got this moon face um, and uh, kind of swelled up a little bit. Uh, I had IBS pretty bad. There were nights where I just had terrible cramps and couldn't sleep. Uh, and then at age nine, I was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. Uh, and this kind of uh, was the, the beginning of what uh, led to my interest in heart disease, because it heavily predisposed me to heart disease, a two to four times increased risk. Um, and so as I you know, went to physicians, I'd see on the wall you know, that type 1 diabetes is, is predisposing to heart disease and all these different other ailments too, like kidney disease and poor circulation and, and bad eyesight and things like that. And so I always wondered why. Um, at age 18, a doctor tried to put me on a blood pressure medication, not because my blood pressure was high, just because that's the standard of care for anybody who'd been type 1 diabetic, as long as I had, uh, to quote unquote protect their kidneys. Uh, that was the solution. I didn't go on the medication though. Um, and then in college, I started to pay attention to my lifestyle, and I figured out that the way I lived my life had a direct impact on my ability to manage these conditions and ultimately, in the long run, cure all of them except type 1 diabetes, which is kind of collateral damage from the inflammation that I had. Um, but it kind of, it also kind of spurned my passion for, for health. Um, and especially heart disease and, and figuring that out. At age 22, a doctor tried to put me on a statin drug, not because I had high cholesterol, and that's not even a reason to put someone on a statin drug anyways, um, but just because that's the standard of care for anybody who'd been type 1 diabetic longer than I had. Uh, that was what they did. That was the, the reflex that they had. And then I went and got a medical education, and I thought that was going to tell me everything about how to be healthy, right, and what to do. Um, and it was a good education, but, you know, I, I was left... Um, wondering what else there could be because I wasn't, I wasn't given the answers that I expected. You know, even with the master's degree, I kept finding, and then I, I eventually figured out I wasn't going to find out through formal education what I wanted to know. And so, eventually, uh, I wrote a few books, as the in introducer uh, told you, um, and that was just from the result of my, my passion for figuring out what causes uh, or creates health. Uh, and this latest one came out in April, Understanding the Heart, and I'm just going to kind of briefly go through uh, what's in that book, uh, and then also uh, we're going to talk about one, one chapter in that book, which is why heart cancer is rare. So in this book, I talk about evolutionary origins of heart disease and the, the things that happened in our past, not just like human past, but like history of life on Earth and multicellular organisms, the, uh, the biochemical pathways that happened that now in our modern day environment are causing disease in general, but especially heart disease. I talk about fourth phase water, which people in this arena are pretty familiar with because of Dr. Cowan, uh, and its impacts on the cardiovascular system. Um, I talk about um, how the heart is not the main mover of blood and how that's relevant, what that tells us about heart failure and what we should do uh, in, in, the, in the case of heart failure. I talk about the true function of the heart, why it's there uh, and what it does. I talk about um, how atherosclerosis is not a buildup of cholesterol, how it's a clotting disorder. Uh, and if you look at atherosclerosis, um, there's really little, very little cholesterol in it uh, when you actually analyze what's in it. I talk about cholesterol and statin drugs um, and that whole theory and how it's uh, kind of a, a big distraction from the actual causes of heart disease. Uh, I talk about what are called metabolic heart attacks, and we're going to talk about that today. Um, I talk about high blood pressure, uh, the true heart healthy diet, um, the best biomarkers for heart disease. That's a big question people have a lot. Uh, the autonomic nervous system, which I think is the most uh, underrated aspect of, of health, especially for heart disease, that we need to know about. Uh, I talk about chiropractic and heart health, dental health and heart health, and then I also talk about my heart attack that I had at the age of 34, um, which shocked me and, and shocks a lot of people, uh, despite knowing this information that happened. And, 
And it, it was ultimately due to stress, and I, and I outlined why that happened and what I've learned from it in the talk I gave uh, about a month ago at Roanoke College, and that's on my YouTube channel if you guys want to check that out. Um, but today, we're going to talk about heart cancer and why it's so rare, okay? So just a few stats here. The vast majority of tumors originating in the heart are benign, uh, so not aggressive tumors. Uh, they're just benign formations, benign masses um, that aren't necessarily harmful. Not good to have, but you know, they're not harmful. Um, in one study, they, did, they looked at 1,200 heart cancer cases, and they found that seven were primary cardiac tumors. So it's very, very rare for heart to originate, or the cancer to originate in the heart. Okay? It's much more likely for you know, cancer to start somewhere else in the body and metastasize to the heart. Um, but for some reason, cancer doesn't form in the heart very often. There's one doctor up in Canada, Robert Cusimano, um, who's what I would consider the closest thing to a cardiac oncologist that we know of. And he's, uh, um, he only gets about 12 cases a year, and most of those are benign tumors. And so primary cardiac tumors are 0.3 to 0.7 percent of all cardiac tumors, uh, so a very small percent. So again, very rare that heart originally form, or cancer originally forms in the heart. Metastasis is, is 30 times more likely. But when it is malignant and it is in the heart, it's, it's a very poor prognosis. Um, so just stats that show you how completely rare it is and why we don't really hear about it. So the reasons why this is, uh, I think it's mainly metabolic. And you know, there's, a, there's a short answer to this. I could tell you the answer right now in one line. I'm not going to. I'll, I'll leave it for the end or near the end. Um, but there's a lot of information that helps us understand why that is that I want to go through. Um, so it may seem like I'm going off on tangents, but it all, it's all relevant. It all comes back to an answer of why the heart doesn't get cancer. So we're going to talk about the metabolic theory of cancer, make sure we understand that. We're going to talk about what I've termed metabolic heart attacks, which are heart attacks that can happen with no blockage whatsoever, because we're all told that you know, a heart attack is caused by a blockage of a blood vessel that restricts blood flow. Um, and I largely disagree with that um, in general. Um, but there's, there's a case where there's no blockage whatsoever in, in a heart attack, or heart tissue uh, death still occurs. And then there's this biophysics. Some people call it quantum aspect of, of, of uh, the body that's also relevant. Uh, and gives us some insight into why the heart's protected from cancer, so to speak. So we're going to go through all those. So first, metabolic theory of cancer. So there's a lot of, you know, this is, this is a complex thing, but basically all you have to understand is that the heart, or tissue in general, uh, in our cells, we use glucose, fatty acids, and ketones. We can use all three of those for fuel to make ATP, okay? And this happens in, uh, in the cytoplasm of our cells. And so we can do this process and we get about 36 ATP if we're using oxygen to do that. And mitochondria are the structures in our cells that allow us to use oxygen. Um, and this is called oxidative phosphorylation. And it makes up about 89% of total cellular ATP. Okay, this is the main process by which we take a cellular fuel and make energy. Now there's actually, you know, research and, and it's pretty well known that burning fatty acids and ketones actually gets us more than 36, okay? So just remember that. Adenosine triphosphate, it's, they say it's like the, the, the currency of the body, that it's kind of the energy source, but I don't necessarily think that. I think that it does other things, which we're gonna talk about. Um, but it's, uh, it's incredibly important for cellular function. Uh, it's it's, the, it's the, what gives us energy, what makes us go, right? So for some reason, in cancer, this process kind of breaks down and we, and we have to go over to what's called fermentation um, or, or glycolysis right here. So this is, um, this is making energy without the use of oxygen. So the body, for some reason, can't use oxygen, and it reverts to going to glycolysis or fermenting lactate, which comes from glycolysis. So it's kind of this recycling process. And this leads, this is called anaerobic respiration, so it's, it's making energy without using oxygen. And this is a very, this is a characteristic of cancer, okay? This is what cancer cells do. Um, they've become very acidic because of this lactate, um, and they, they're become very toxic because they're only making two ATP in this process, which is way less than this, and way less than burning fatty acids. Um, so it's a very inefficient process, um, but the cell does it for some reason, and that's because it can't use oxygen. And so this is how we can detect cancer, because we put radioactive glucose into the body, and then we do a DEXA scan, and we can look at where the glucose is being utilized heavily, because glucose is being used very heavily in this process, and we can tell where in the body cancer is. That's how they kind of detect it. Make sense? 
So, something else we have to understand about this metabolic theory of cancer. Uh, this is directly from uh, Thomas Seafried's book. Although no specific gene mutation or chromosomal abnormality is common to all cancers, nearly all cancers express elevated fermentation, okay, regardless of their tissue or cellular origin. So, they've done studies where they take the DNA from a healthy cell and they put it into a cancerous cell, and those cells that they do that to stay cancerous. So we're told that you know, cancer is this genetic disease, which is, I think, false, not driven by any gene or anything like that. And then we've proved that when we put this healthy DNA into the nucleus of this cell, and the cell stays cancerous, and the cells that come from that cell are also cancerous. Okay? Now, vice versa, they've taken DNA from cancer cells and they put it into a healthy cell, and that cell stays healthy. Okay, and the, the cells that reproduce from that cell also stay healthy, which suggests that what's happening in cancer is not happening in the nucleus. It's happening in the cytoplasm, which is where the mitochondria are, which is where metabolism and respiration is happening. And it's also where um, the cell holds its structure, which we're going to talk about too. Okay? So the question is, why does the heart, or the tissue in the heart, uh, rarely go from this oxidative phosphorylation to fermentation um, or glycolysis. So, to answer that question, we have to talk about what are called metabolic heart attacks. It gives us an idea. Um, and this is, this is very, very important uh, to understand these imbalances uh, that, that drive this. And so there are three imbalances that I think that drive that, um, but just some stats first. So these are called Minocas. Um, and it's, it's, it's recognized in Western medicine that these happen. So these are myocardial infarction with non-obstructed coronary arteries. No stenosis, no blockage whatsoever, but heart tissue dies for some reason. So in 5 to 20% of cases, angiogram will show no obstructive coronary artery disease, um, yet they had tissue damage. Uh, more common in women than in men, and it affects up to 187,000 people in the United States each year, which is quite a bit. Um, so, you know, kind of a, a problem that, you know, not many people know about, that this can happen. We're all told, oh yeah, cholesterol clogs an artery, restricts blood flow, causes heart attacks. So, to prove that this kind of stuff happens, there was some very interesting work done by a, um, a pathologist uh, named Giorgio Baraldi. Um, and so what he did is he did these plastic cast studies. Everybody been to like the, the Body World exhibits or Animal Inside Out exhibits? And sometimes they'll have like a perfect cast of the arterial system of some animal or some organ or something like that. He developed this, this uh, technique. And basically what he did uh, was he injected like a neoprene or latex solution into the arterial system of the heart and he filled, um, or yeah, of hearts, but you could do it with any organ. Um, and, and then he, once that hardened, then he dissolved away the tissue with hydrochloric acid and he was left with this perfect cast of the arterial system. And then he studied them um, and he found that um, anywhere that there was a more than 70% or more stenosis of an artery or narrowing of an artery, that the body had built collateral arteries around it to fully compensate uh, for that stenosis. Um, and in my book, I talk about studies that show that those collateral arteries that compensate the heart with blood can form within four days, so pretty fast. Um, and so I've, I've been told by cardiologists that some people are fortunate enough to have collaterals and some people are not. However, in his studies, he found that any severely obstructed coronary artery uh, lesion was always fully compensated by these, uh, by these collaterals. Um, and so I, I kind of call it the Medusa. You can see all the different collateral arteries that kind of come around um, and, and compensate that, that stenosis. And so what he also did was he, he studied people who had heart disease and didn't have heart disease. Um, and he found that there were people who died of like a car accident or something like that, that, that he studied their hearts and they had severe stenoses. Uh, their arteries, yet they had no cardiovascular symptoms uh, prior to that accident. They had never had a history of heart disease uh, and no symptoms. Um, and then he found people who, who died of a heart attack and had no atherosclerosis in their arteries whatsoever. Um, and so, just very interesting, and this is just a depiction of how up there at the top is where the stenosis is, yet the heart attack they had was down here, not anywhere near where that artery delivers blood. Um, so this tissue died for some other reason, okay? So, what can cause a heart attack without a blockage? And I think it, it, it can happen due to, a, due to three different imbalances in the body, uh, and that is poor metabolism, uh, oxidative stress, and an imbalance in the stress response of the autonomic nervous system. So, first one, just kind of go through these imbalances first, and I'll, I'll tell you how they come together and cause those metabolic heart attacks. Um, but the first one is, is poor metabolic health. So this is 
insulin resistance, which is the characteristic of, of type 2 diabetes, which is an epidemic of in the country. And this study here shows that. Um, the ability to metabolize food in a way that doesn't harm you is very, very common. Uh, and this was a study uh, done, uh, they, they surveyed, or they looked at things from 2000, 2009 to 2016, and they found, or they estimated based on um, what they found, that 88% of the American population is metabolically unhealthy, has some form of insulin resistance. And there's actually another study, a newer study that came out after the pandemic that, um, that brings the, the percent of the population uh, that is metabolically healthy from 12 to about 7 or 8. Um, so, you know, COVID had that effect. Everybody went home and they started eating bad food and, and, and things like that. Um, so a big problem, okay? But it's, it's basically the inability of the cell to respond or to uh, the body to respond to insulin properly. Then there's um, this electron-hungry process known as oxidative stress. And oxidative stress is just when we have an abundance of what are called free radicals in the body. Free radicals are things that have an unpaired electron and they really want to be paired. I call them the Looney Tunes, Tasmanian Devil. They're going around like crazy trying to find something that's paired and destroying everything else in the process, right? Um, and so they really want to find that extra electron and they'll steal it from anywhere. And so these are naturally made in the process of burning any fuel source um, and they're actually not um, supposed to be harmful unless we get excess of them. They're actually active signaling molecules. They're normally neutralized uh, by an antioxidants that our bodies make. Um, glutathione and things like that that our, that our cells make. They're highly reactive, like I said, they really want to find a pair and they're going to do anything they can to find it. They have a very short half-life, they don't last very long because they find that pair quickly. They generate new free radicals every time they find that paired electron. They cause damage to cells, tissues, and exclusion zone water, which you know, we're familiar with and we're going to talk about here. And they're caused by things like heavy metals, endotoxemia, uh, high blood sugars, advanced glycation in products, which are when things get damaged by glucose, uh, environmental toxins, seed oils, electromagnetic fields, all these things can cause oxidative stress. And then the last one is an imbalance in our autonomic nervous system. So our autonomic nervous system is a system in our body that's measuring our environment through our senses and telling us if we're in a safe or threatening environment. And based on which one we're in, the body will react accordingly. Do I need to get away from this threat or, do, or can I relax and eat and sleep and things like that? Which one can I do? And I, I outline this here, I put this picture up here of a reptile evolving to a mammal because something very important happened in the evolution of our stress response when that happened. So, you know, reptiles have a very slow metabolism um, and they can actually shut down organs without causing damage. Uh, this is the play dead response that they seem to have. Um, however, in order to evolve into a mammal, we couldn't have that stress response of shut down because we're very metabolically active, we're warm blooded. Um, and if we shut down an organ, it's going to get damaged very quickly. And so we had to evolve a different stress response, a separate stress, re stress response, so we can have a stress response and not shut down an organ and not shut down the body. And that's what happened in our vagus nerve um, when, well, not ours, but in mammals' vagus nerves when, when they went from, uh, it's what happened during the evolution from reptiles to mammals, is the, the vagus nerve split, allowing that process to happen. And I'm going to touch a bit more on that in a minute. So, with those three imbalances in mind, poor metabolic health, oxidative stress, imbalance in the autonomic nervous system, we're going to put those together and see how that can lead to something that could be uh, pretty harmful to the heart, okay? So, if we have this gradual inhibition of parasympathetic, so it's, 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 a, it's a dominant stress response and not enough, you know, rest and digest, calm response. They're always happening at the same time. But through chronic stress, or through thinking we're in a stressful environment, even if we're not, because humans can do that, we get this gradual inhibition of a non-stress response. And then we can get depletion. Oh yeah, so this study shows heart rate variability is the best measure of balance in our autonomic nervous system, um, of balance in that stress response. How well do we adapt to a stress? And this is from a study that shows that before, um, this is an hour before um, someone had a heart attack, their heart rate variability plummeted. And that the event, it went super low and then it came back up, okay, it recovered. Um, and so this stress response, uh, this imbalance, uh, is, is dominant before someone has a heart attack. We can get a depletion of nitric oxide, which is the, one of the substances, the, a, sub, a substance that dilates the blood vessel, um, but also acts as an antioxidant. We can get depletion of that through oxidative stress, um, and this is a study that shows uh, that uh, nitric oxide can act like an um, antioxidant and minimize free radicals, so if we have oxidative stress, it becomes depleted. Uh, and that's very important to this process. And then we can have an acute stressful event that can trigger 
um, acute stress signaling to the heart. Okay? And here is a diagram that shows that. So we have this, this autonomic nervous system signaling. There should be a stress response and a non-stress response. And that's depicted here, both of those. The stress response um, is signaled by CAMP when it gets into the heart cells. Okay? But if we want that non-stress response that's supposed to balance things out, keep us in homeostasis, if we want that, we need nitric oxide. It needs that to get into the cells. So if we don't have that because it's been depleted by oxidative stress, then we don't get the CGMP signal of the rest and digest, the, the relaxed uh, um, response of the nervous system. And so we get this surge in sympathetic activity, the surge in stress response by this acute chronic stress, and we don't get the break, and then we get all these metabolic issues, which we're going to talk about here. And so when that happens, this surge of adrenaline causes the heart cells to revert to burning glucose, okay? which we talked about is, is a problem, right? That's, that's cancer's problem. Okay, and so this study shows that when we get that surge of sympathetic response, it shuts down the inhibition of that, of, like usually in the heart cells, there's an inhibition of burning glucose. It wants to burn more fatty acids. And when that surge of adrenaline happens, it shuts down that burning of glucose, or uh, the inhibition of burning glucose, and we start burning more glucose than the heart wants to. Okay, that results in a buildup of lactic acid and hydrogen ions in cardiac cells, okay, and this is, this is similar to if you go for a run uh, and your leg starts to burn, right, because you're using that muscle. You're burning through glycogen, which is stored in the muscle, and you get that muscle burn, um, and that's a buildup of lactic acid and, and hydrogen ions. Uh, for some reason, the heart doesn't like to do that. It'd rather burn fatty acids, but in this situation, it will, and that's when we get chest pain, angina. It's the same burn we feel in a muscle when we're running, right? So what that does... Well, this is just a study that shows that the increase of, of lactate production from burning glucose goes up eight times in this situation when we get that surge to the stress, uh, the stress signal to the heart. And so what that does, when we get this lactic acid buildup, it actually interferes with calcium entering the cell. Okay? And that's a big problem because calcium is what the, the uh, muscle cells use to contract. That's the heart's job, contract, right? And so if we don't have enough calcium there, uh, then we get all these kind of issues. We get arrhythmias, we get uh, interruption and contractivity, which is decreasing the function of the heart, all kinds of dysfunction in heart, in heart cells. And so that uh, can also, when that lactic acid builds up, it creates this swelling in the heart. Okay, so usually the, uh, the pressure is more coming from the arteries into the cells of the heart, and that's how the blood gets in. But if we get this swelling, this buildup of lactic acid in there, um, we get this edema, now the pressure is more here and it prevents the blood from getting in and we get this stagnant blood that's just kind of recycled, it's, it's low oxygen. And so that's called paradoxical bulging. It's depicted here in this picture, we get a stretching out of the tissue of, of the side of the heart um, and that is what causes the tissue death because it's not getting new blood, it's not getting oxygen um, and it all results from these imbalances that I was talking about. It causes localized edema, dysfunctional cell walls and necrosis which is t t tissue death which is a heart attack. Um, all stemming from, again, this inhibition of, of parasympathetic activity, depletion of nitric oxide due to oxidative stress, and um, uh, an imbalance in the autonomic nervous system. Okay? So, that shows us that there's two paths to a cell burning more glucose, to fermentation, to glycolysis. Okay? One of those paths we talked about is how when there's oxygen present, but the mitochondria can't use it, um, and that can, damage to mitochondria can happen from x-rays, chemicals, electromagnetic fields, reactive oxygen species, the oxidative stress I was talking about. Um, so that damages the ability of the cell to use oxygen and it reverts to fermentation. It has to make energy some other way and that's what cancer is. It reverts to that. Now it's not, it's a short-term process to keep the cell alive because uh, it has to. Long-term, not a great idea, but in the short-term the cell stays alive. Um, and now we've also learned just now that if we, in a heart cell, we can get this surge of adrenaline, the surge of stress response, and that can inhibit the non-stress response coming into the cell. So there's oxygen still present, but that surge causes the cell to burn more glucose, go into fermentation like it doesn't want to. Um, so two paths to this fermentation. Now, why, when this happens in the heart cell, or when this happens in normal tissue, we can't use oxygen, we go to fermentation. Why does it become cancerous? And why does it not become cancerous in a heart cell? The answer, the one-liner, is that heart cells can't divide. Okay? So somewhere in their development, 
heart cells give up the ability to divide and become new tissues. And that's the characteristic of cancer, it's this, this um, rapidly dividing cell that's uncontrolled division. They're undifferentiated cells. And so if a cell can't divide, and it's forced to burn more glucose than it wants to and go to this fermentation, it dies, right? And that's what we see. We see tissue death. Uh, and Otto Warburg, you know, the father of the metabolic theory of cancer, said that cells that die can never become tumorigenic, okay? So interesting. And it's thought that the reason that they gave this up is because heart cells are so metabolically active that, I mean, the process of cell division requires so much ATP that to continue contracting and divide cells was just too much energy demand. Um, and so they evolutionarily gave up this, um, this ability to divide, which is why heart attacks are so serious. Because if a heart tissue dies, you can't just regenerate more cells or make new cells from the ones that are still there. You have to try and repair the damaged ones, um, which is the task. Um, so pretty interesting. So what does that have to do with metabolism? It appears that, um, I mean, the majority of, of the energy that the heart uh, gets is from fatty acids and ketones. We're from fatty acids. And if we add ketones to that, we increase the efficiency of the energy that the heart can produce um, by about 28%. So fatty acids and ketones are very, very important uh, to this process. So the heart has these, I think, protective mechanisms that keep it burning fatty acids and ketones, uh, keep them available uh, so that we never have to go into that fermentation or very rarely have to go into that fermentation. Um, that causes the tissue death. And that is that it's, um, fatty acids are packaged in chylomicrons, which are a big lipoprotein, and so um, they're almost like, chylomicrons are too big to absorb in our gut, so they go um, from the gut directly into the lymphatic system, uh, which is kind of our drainage system. And that drains directly into the uh, veins that lead directly to the heart, okay? And so then they have to go through the lungs, but they just get oxygen from that. And then after they go back to the heart, they're de delivered right t directly to the heart. The first thing it does is it goes right to the heart. So it's almost like the heart's getting preferential uh, uh, fuel from those fatty acids by being packaged in chylomicrons. It has this system that delivers it to the heart first. Okay? The heart also has a direct signaling pathway to fat cells. So when, when the heart um, is struggling, say it's burning more glucose than it wants to, there's actually mechanisms that tell the fat cells to mobilize fats. Uh, to release them so that the heart can burn more fatty acids, uh, which is pretty interesting. And the heart prefers fatty acids and ketones for fuel. Um, so I'm going to talk about a study here in a minute that, that shows that. Here it is. Um, and so if we look at this study, what they did um, was they had uh, these cells uh, burning lactate and burning, so this is glycolysis, this is fermentation. And so when they had that in there, and then they went and they put um, ketones, beta-hydroxybutyrate, into those cells, and these are myocardial cells. Um, when they put ketones in there, you can see as the concentration went up, the utilization, utilization of lactate went down. So even in the presence of glucose, um, the, the, uh, the body uh, prefers to burn the ketones. Put the ketones in there, it'll choose those first, which is unlike other tissues in the body. Like people have heard of ketogenic diets, and you have to restrict the glucose to force the body to burn the fatty acids. But in the case of the heart, it doesn't do that. So it says here, beta-hydroxybutyrate inhibited lactate oxidation by the myocytes by 30 to 60 percent, uh, and the inhibition was concentration dependent. The more ketones that were there, the less lactate it used. Um, however, I feel that evolution was not accounting for this imbalance in the autonomic nervous system that can create this surge in stress response, forcing the heart to burn more glucose than it was supposed to. It was never accounting for the fact that we live in this, this society that you know, uh, stresses us out, it makes us think we're in life-threatening situations when we're really not. Because uh, humans are the only species that can think their way into a stress response, even if nothing stressful is actually happening to them. So then, that's kind of the metabolic side of things. And the metabolic side of things is relevant here, but there's also this biophysics, or some people call it quantum side of things, which is really interesting. Um, and if you listen to Dr. Cowan yesterday, you're, you're somewhat familiar with this. So we're all told that we're a large percentage water, right? Um, but I don't slosh around like a water bed. Like if I move over here, I don't feel the water in me go over here, right? So if I, it's because it's we're in a gel state, right? Most of the water in our body is in a gel state. So if I take the tissue of my forearm and I kind of pinch it, it's kind of like jello, right? I can push it, it goes away, and then it comes back, okay? So most of the water in our body is in this gel state. So what is this gel state? It's called fourth phase water or exclusion zone water or structured water. And what happens is when water holds sufficient energy and it gets next to a hydrophilic surface, then it actually cleaves off 
one of the hydrogens here and puts that aside. And it takes these two here and it combines with other ones, other hydrogens and oxygens, and forms this lattice-like structure like this. Uh, and those, those structures will kind of line up planarly onto a hydrophilic surface, OK? So what we need to form you know, this gel, this fourth phase water, in the body is water, a hydrophilic surface, and radiant energy to energize the water so they can do this, OK? Now, this happens on the lining of arteries. It happens um, in tree roots, and, and it happens in, in nature. It happens uh, in our cells as well. And so what's interesting here is that it's called exclusion zone water because when it forms, it excludes anything that's not it, OK? Aside from a few small hydrated minerals. And so here, this thing called the Hofmeister series is basically just putting in order the size of these minerals that have been hydrated by water. Um, and so, you know, magnesium is the biggest, going down to nitrate there. And so what's, what can get into, what can penetrate exclusion zone water is anything that's the size of potassium or, or smaller. But at these things here, they can't. They can't penetrate exclusion zone water. So when we look at what, how a cell distributes ions, distributes these things, it's very curious to find that potassium is concentrated inside a cell and sodium is concentrated outside the cell. So there's the division point where when the exclusion zone water and, and the cell, the gel of our cells is complete and intact and healthy, it creates this ion distribution. Okay, and this is what we see. Now, you might ask, why, why is the cell so electronegative, even though there's positive potassium in it? It's because there's also chloride in it, and, which is negative, and there's also large proteins that are very negative in nature. Um, so without the potassium in there, it would, it would, it would be um, very negative, but it's only low negative. So what this does, though, is we all know that opposite charges repel each other slightly, right? And so this creates this, this charge system where we have an electronegative cell um, and positive extracellular space, and it keeps the cells kind of away from each other because if the cells get too close, they're too negative, and so they, they, they kind of repel each other. So it keeps this nice oriented, you know, cellular structure, um, not just structure inside the cell, but the structure of a tissue as a whole, okay? Now, remember I told you that to form fourth phase water, we need, um, we need a hydrophilic surface, radiant energy, and we need water, okay? So we have water in cells, that's the cytoplasm. Um, radiant energy can come from outside, um, from different things. Um, but where's the hydrophilic surface inside the cell? You could consider, you know, the cell membrane a hydrophilic surface. Um, but how about inside the cell? How does that happen? And it's because we have this network of proteins inside the cell called the microtubercular lattice. Uh, and there, um, there's research that shows that water in the cell is no more than 0.5 nanometers away from any um, structure of this microtubercular lattice. And this is what binds us and connects us all together. It's the force, right? You know, like Star Wars? It binds everything together, right? Um, because the fascia in the body, so that we're made up of water, and that's everywhere, and we're made up of fascia, uh, this myo myofascia. And that's connecting everything together, and it's connecting us to all the water in our body um, through these microtubercular um, lattice that's found on a microscopic level in the cell. So, in order to those, the proteins that make up that microtubercular lattice are all folded up. And in order to unfold them to create more surface area, more hydrophilic surfaces so this gel can form inside the cells, we need to unfold the proteins. And the thing that does that is ATP. So when the guy asks about, you know, what is ATP, it's energy. Really, it's what unfolds the proteins in the, in the structure of the cell um, to make more uh, surface area to form fourth phase water to keep, you know, to keep me feeling like jello, right? So just to review, just to kind of put it all together, when mitochondria are healthy, we're making lots of ATP. We're also making other things like water, which is energized water. We're making heat, which is why we're warm-blooded. And that's infrared heat, which is very important. We're going to talk about that. Um, and we're making those quote unquote waste products of oxidative stress, those reactive oxygen species. But they're not really waste products. They have a, they have a function. They're signaling molecules that tell the body whether we're full and things like that. Uh, if we get too many of them, there'd be a problem. So we have healthy mitochondria uh, making lots of ATP, burning fatty acids and ketones, things like that. Um, and they, they go in and they unfold the proteins. That's their main job, creating more surface area. That leads to this network of microtubercular lattice in the cells that allows the cell to form fourth phase water um, and maintain its structure. 
Um, there's fourth phase water, and so we get this nice picture of these cells, you know, evenly spaced, and we get healthy tissue. Now, if we get this damaged mitochondria that can't use oxygen, and we go into fermentation, making very little ATP, um, and working really hard, we're burning so much glucose trying to make enough ATP, that we don't get enough ATP to unbind the proteins, we don't get an adequate microtubecular lattice, we don't get fourth phase water formation, and we get tissue that looks like this. The cells are all clumped together, which to me feels like a tumor, right? It feels like something that doesn't feel like normal tissue, like gel, it feels like this hard mass in there. These cells are all clumped together, okay? And this is exactly what Otto Warburg said. He said that the irreversible injuring of respiration is followed as the second phase of cancer formation by a long struggle for existence by the, cell, the injured cells to maintain their structure. So they cannot maintain the microtubercular lattice and the fourth phase water. They break down into this, this poor, and, they, and that's what he found, a characteristic of cancer cells, was that they had poor structure. They didn't look like normal cells um, because they couldn't maintain this because of poor metabolism. So when we look at the mitochondria, heart tissue is one of the densest with mitochondria. Um, it really concentrates them there uh, because um, uh, the heart is always contracting, um, but also this allows for lots of ATP production, um, which maintains all that stuff. Um, heart muscle tissue prefers fatty acids and ketones. We saw that, you know, when we, even in the presence of glucose and lactate, put ketones in there, the heart burns those first, which gives us more ATP. And the presence of ketones has been shown to increase mitochondrial respiration using oxygen, oxidative phosphorylation, by 128%. Um, so ketones, very important to that process. All right. Now, there's one other thing that I think gives the heart protection against, um, against cancer, and that is that the heart emits an electromagnetic field that's five times stronger than that of the brain. You'd think the most electrical organ in our body, the brain, would have the most, the highest, you know, electromagnetic field. You know, we talk about EMFs and things like that and how harmful they are, but there's good electromagnetic fields, like from the Earth, from other humans, the one our heart's giving off. Um, and I believe that that electromagnetic field does two things. One, it's the radiant energy. It provides some radiant energy that structures water um, or energizes water so that it can structure itself next to the, the um, microtrophecular lattice. Um, and also, I think that having that much of that electromagnetic field kind of wards off poor ones. However, like, you know, electromagnetic fields like Wi-Fi and things like that that are, that are more harmful to us or not compatible with our physiology. However, the stronger and stronger that electromagn these artificial electromagnetic fields get, um, the more they'll affect us. They'll, they'll, um, uh, they'll damage the heart. And so this is what we see in this study here. It looked at electromagnetic fields uh, induce oxidative stress and pathophysiological changes in the cardiovascular system and less. I think these, these guys struggle with English a little bit, but loss of area in sarcomeres, which are muscle cells, uh, small little, little units of, of uh, what's in muscle, muscle cells. Um, so loss of area. So remember, spatial orientation, not the same. Clumped down, they lost the area. Irregular structure. Remember, we're losing structure in cells, in myocardial cells. Uh, rupture of the sarcomeres, which are the little components that make up the muscle cells. And loss of mitochondria. You lose mitochondria, you're not making ATP. You're not unfolding proteins. You're not forming fourth phase water. So this is what they see. You know, electromagnetic fields can damage this process of how the body stays healthy and maintain its structure. So looking at these stats, you might think, well, the heart's got it covered. You know, why do I care? You know, what do I, what do I care about? It's kind of like you know, looking at all the diseases that you could, you could try and prevent, saying, oh, I want to prevent heart cancer. It's kind of like saying, of all the causes of greenhouse gases, I want to focus on the cows, right? Not the problem, right? Um, so what I do care about, though, is these imbalances that cause these metabolic heart attacks that can force the heart to burn more glucose than it wants. So I want to leave you guys with some, some strategies you can use to combat those three imbalances. So first, we'll talk about cellular fermentation. So in Thomas Seafried's book, Cancer is a Metabolic Disease, um, he talks about how ketone, ketone bodies and fatty acids are non-fermentable fuel sources. So even if our heart wanted to go into fermentation or our cells wanted to go into fermentation and using glucose, these are not fuels they can use to do that. So these are the fuels we should provide our body with so that it has no option to do that, right? 
Um, so making sure ketones and fatty acids are our main, main fuel source. So if we look at this study here, um, what they did in this study was they, they, um, they gave these cells things, toxins pretty much, that inhibited their ability to use oxygen. So they used fluoroacetate and oligomycin to basically poison the cells to where they couldn't use oxygen. So they were doing that, and then even when they did that, if they put beta-hydroxybutyrate, a ketone, in there, you can see that when they, um, when they did that, when they put the ketones in there, the utilization of oxygen went up. So even though they were giving it these toxins that prevented the cell from using oxygen, you put ketones in there, it still used more oxygen okay, to, to make fuel. Um, and so pretty fascinating. That's how strong the power of this, these metabolic um, substrates is. Uh, we use those for fuel. We're going to get a good result. So that's how we create metabolic health, burning fatty acids and ketones. But there are lots of things we can do to create metabolic health, which again is, is insulin sensitivity, the ability of the body to, to use insulin, whereas insulin uh, resistance is type 2 diabetes. So exercise, specifically you know, resistance exercise, lifting heavy objects and things like that, or some resistance against your muscle, or high-intensity interval training, uh, really important for doing that. Uh, an air filter, so reducing toxin exposure, you know, getting an air filter in your bedroom, um, especially um, you know, have filtering your air, especially where you sleep, because we can't control all our air. Um, avoid toxins and chemicals as much as you can. Uh, there's lots of you know, synthetic things that affect us. Avoid artificial sweeteners. So people think that, oh, I can just not eat sugar, and that's not going to have an effect on my glucose. But these things actually trigger your body that the glucose is coming, and your body has the same response. Um, so it doesn't really help avoid insulin resistance. Uh, minimize endotoxemia, which is the presence of bacteria in the blood that shouldn't be there. So that happens mainly from leaky gut or poor dental health. Um, that's where those bacteria can leak in. Get enough mineral salt. Lack of, lack of salt has been shown to cause insulin resistance or contribute to it. Getting enough sleep, you know, balancing your circadian rhythm, uh, making sure that's optimal. Uh, don't be sedentary. Even if you're not exercising, you know, you know, don't be sitting in lecture halls all day long, guys. Jeez. Um, intermittent fasting. Um, reducing stress, and then diet uh, is probably the main way that we create metabolic health. So avoiding the processed grains, uh, the fructose, processed sugar, and of course the seed oils. I think those are really driving poor metabolic health. Okay, so that's the fermentation. That's how we stay away from that. Um, so how do we stay away from depletion of nitric oxide or this oxidative stress? Um, again, ketones, having ketones around, um, produces less oxidative stress. The study showed that um, created beneficial mitochondrial changes that reduce hydrogen peroxide, which is one free radical that can be created, um, and increased mitochondrial respiration. So um, ketones heal the mitochondria. Now, it's probably one of my favorite things to talk about is infrared sauna. So one of the ways that we can get radiant energy into our body is infrared light. And the sun's the original source of infrared light. 40% of the sun's rays are infrared light. Um, but we can, you know, in the modern day, use technology to expose ourselves to infrared light. And we look at the studies on this, um, the, the uh, sauna therapy, exposing yourself to infrared light, resulted in higher amounts of nitric oxide, um, so less oxidative stress. And the reason it does this is because nitric oxide is made in the lining of the artery, and when we energize the water in the body, it can form on the lining of the artery, and it doesn't just propel blood flow, but it also protects the lining, because it's an exclusion zone. So it prevents anything that's not it from getting to the lining of the artery. So creating that, that, um, that protective barrier is really important. It allows the cells in the lining of the artery to heal and then produce more nitric oxide, because that's where it's produced. And there's another study here, repeated sauna therapy, um, reduced blood pressure, increased nitric oxide. So this is um, flow-mediated dilatation, which dilation is what nitric oxide does. So then when they're measuring that, more nitric oxide was around. And you can see that that increased quite a bit in the people who used sauna versus the ones who didn't. Um, repeated thermal therapy improves impaired endothelial function in patients. So endothelial is just the lining of the artery um, with coronary risk factors suggesting a preventative role for thermal therapy for atherosclerosis to protect the lining of the artery. So those are a few ways we can, we can deplete or we can uh, protect ourselves from oxidative stress. And so then autonomic nervous system imbalance. There are many, many things that create this. Um, everything from being in contact with nature to loving relationships to diet to all kinds of stuff. And I'm just going to talk about two of them. Uh, that is, you know, a higher fat, metabolically flexible diet, a diet that allows us to go readily back and forth from burning carbohydrates and fats, um, and sunlight and infrared sauna. 
So this is a study here that shows that supplementation with omega-3 fatty acids creates balance in the autonomic nervous system. Um, and so I found that interesting. It, it increases heart rate variability. But I'm not necessarily saying that we should all supplement with omega-3s. I think that we should really decrease this consumption of omega-6s because it's about the ratio. Right? It's about the ratio of omega-3 to omega-6s. And the problem is that we don't, and the problem is not that we don't have enough omega-3s, it's that we have way too much omega-6s, or the general population does. Right? So if we want to fix that ratio, we should decrease the omega-6s rather than taking you know, tons and tons of supplements, because lots of times these supplements, these omega-3 supplements are garanted. You know, they, once you take them out of the fish, they start to oxidize. Uh, and so I'd rather people just decrease the omega-6. And that, I, I believe, would have the same effect on the autonomic nervous system. Uh, it would uh, balance the heart rate variability. So this is probably my favorite study I'm going to show you, because I never expected to find something like this. Um, but this is, this is a study where they gave one group um, a high-carbohydrate beverage. It was fruit juice. And they gave another group a high-fat beverage, which was heavy cream. And, and so um, they found that no matter what they did, in both groups, it increased sympathetic activity, increased the stress response. It, so it, it, it created that surge, a little bit of a surge of, of adrenaline, just by eating in general. However, they found that a high-carbohydrate beverage uh, produced greater sympathetic modulation, greater stress response. And stored, mat metabolism of stored and ingested fat was associated with relatively lower sympathetic modulation. So eating a diet um, higher in fat uh, is going to uh, increase sympathetic activation much less. Okay, so if we're already super stressed out um, about the world or whatever, and we're having this high stress response, eating a higher fat diet is going to be way more helpful and not contribute to that imbalance. And then, again, sauna or just infrared light exposure, things like that. Um, so this is what they, they, they put these people in a sauna, and they found that Doing the sauna, it increased sympathetic because that's a hormetic stress. It's, a, it's like a good stress that trains your body to be more resistant to stress. Okay? Um, and there's lots of different hormetic stresses, uh, exercise being one. Um, but these are good stresses that you can see that in the, in the cool down, um, during the cooling down period from sauna bathing, heart rate variability increased, which in, in, indicates the dominant role of parasympathetic activity and decreased sympathetic activity of cardiac autonomic nervous system. Um, so creating that, that stress response of heat and sweat and things like that um, uh, in the long run helps train our bodies to be more resistant to, to stress, to have a stress response and come back to homeostasis uh, more readily. So that's the ANS imbalance. So to summarize, cancer of the heart is one of the rarest cancers. This is in large part due to the unique metabolism of the heart combined with the inability of the heart cells to divide. However, a forced change in the preferred met metabolism of the heart could lead to something acutely worse than cancer, which is a myocardial infarction without a blockage. The presence and preference of ketones seems to be protective metabolically and biophysically for the heart. And a metabolically flexible diet and radiant energy exposure can help balance the imbalances that predispose us to metabolic heart attacks. So the take homes are that heart disease and, and heart attacks are about way more than cholesterol and LDL, right? So, you know, the, the usual assumption uh, by most medical doctors and cardiologists is you go in, you take your lipid panel, it looks good, you're good. If you, if you have high cholesterol, it's bad, you treat the cholesterol. And it's way more than that. And that was the main purpose of my book, is to take the attention away from that uh, and toward the other things that actually cause heart disease. Understanding why the heart is resistant to a certain pathology is just as important as understanding why it commonly gets another pathology, because it helps us learn about health and what creates health. This gives us new insights into heart metabolism, preventing heart disease, and creating overall health. Eat in a way that keeps ketones around, expose your body to radiant energy, and keep your body in an electromagnetically appropriate environment. And I like to say, ferment your food, not your cellular fuel. So that's it. People, you guys can find me on social media. That's my website. And obviously the book, I have, I have the book for sale at my booth uh, out there in the big E room. And then Chelsea Green also has it at their booth right next to the registration desk. So uh, you can find the book there. Yeah. And then questions, yeah. Oh, I don't know if I'm ready for this one. I got to turn it on, yeah.
now it's on. Great talk, thank you. Um, so my understanding of the conventional explanation of myocardial infarction is that usually it's a thrombosis that's blocking the blood supply, but when it's not, it's usually triple vessel disease where all three coronary arteries are substantially occluded. In the beginning, I th if I remember correctly, the, the definition of, and I forgot the acronym, but the, what okay. we call the metabolic heart attack, was that none of the vessels were more than 50% occluded. I guess my question is, if all the vessels were 45% stenosis, then you still have narrowing of the lumen, which is a substantial decrease in the potential oxygen supply, which is the limiting factor for lactate production. So even in your model, it would seem that stenosis would be a, a pretty serious contributor to mm. the, you know, layer of metabolic stress on top of that and, and the lactate production. Um, so I was just, I guess, wanted your, your, your comment on, yeah. on that. Yeah. No, I, I actually really appreciate that because I never thought about that too. Like, just if you get a stenosis, it could be restricting blood flow, which is already going to prevent oxygen getting to um, the cells a little bit. There's the collateral arteries that, but yeah, if it's like 45%, the collateral is not necessarily there yet. Um, and so that could create a situation where a stress response is more likely to create that surge, uh, take you away from oxygen utilization even more. Yeah, so those stenosis, that, that's actually interesting. Um, I, I never really thought about that. So that's, it becomes a, a, a point where those, you know, mildly stenotic arteries are more relevant. Yeah. Uh, just to continue on that last question, Dr. Cowan's theory is that the lactic acid will build up, causes edema. The mm. edema will put the pressure in the coronary arteries, mm. and the coronary arteries might break loose the plaque inside the coronary arteries. So he likes to take, uh, to reduce the lactic acid, he has a medication called strophanthus. Right. And that will take, convert the lactic acid to pyruvate, mm. which our body can metabolize. But that wasn't my main question. <laughs> you, you mentioned different metabolic uh, procedures to improve our metabolic capacity, also our autonomic nervous system. Mm -hmm. Now with the COVID jab, people are getting myocarditis, dying instantly. Uh, where does that fit into your talk? Yeah, so that, uh, that's kind of a separate talk. Yeah, um, and, 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 uh, but yeah, that's super relevant. And like, so atherosclerosis, uh, is clotting. You know, when you look at what the components of atherosclerosis are, uh, it's clotting material for a lot, the most part of it. Um, if there's calcium in there and other things. There's some cholesterol in there, but it's really no more than, you know, the amount of cholesterol that happens to be around when the clot forms. It just kind of gets sucked into it. Um, so it's not this gradual buildup of cholesterol. Um, and there's also some things with a certain type of lipoprotein, LP little a, that it gets, it ends up in there as well because it's, trying to inhibit the breakdown of clotting. But in general, atherosclerosis is clotting material. Okay, so we have to ask ourselves what causes the artery to clot, right? It's the same kind of thing that if I get a cut on my skin, a clot's gonna form and form a scab. So it's the same thing, more or less. Um, when there's damage to the lining of an artery, if the artery can't repair itself, um, which insulin signaling is very important to repair itself and the endothelial cells are supposed to repair themselves, if they can't, a clot forms. because the, because if it doesn't do that, then more damage could happen and, and it could even rupture the artery and cause bleeding and, and into the um, outside the artery. So it clots. And so atherosclerosis is this buildup of clot after clot after clot after clot. And so if we ask ourselves what damages the lining of an artery, um, forcing clots to form, it's electromagnetic fields, it's toxin exposure, it's poor diets, things, those reactive oxygen species, it's injecting toxins into your body. Right? And these are, these are very potent and high amounts of toxins uh, that, when your body's exposed to them, will induce clotting. And so that's why we're seeing clots uh, when people are getting uh, the vaccines or, or lots of different vaccines is because it's inducing clotting. It's the exact things that create oxidative stress, damage arteries, and cause it to clot. But it's happening so fast. I mm -hmm. think tonight Robert F. Kennedy Jr. will discuss some of the problems of people just dying of a heart attack almost mm -hmm. within hours. Yeah, I mean, you inject them, they go right into the bloodstream, they're there, and, and it's not, 
because it's not that this gradual buildup of, of, of a clotting can narrow the artery over time, but if it happens slow enough, the body builds the collaterals around it and compensates for it. However, it can happen fast enough that a large enough clot forms that can block the whole artery right there. Boom, just like that. So I, I believe that's what happened to me. Um, so I didn't have vaccine. I'm just saying other things caused that, that clot to form. But, um, but yeah. So one of your slides had the Warburg comment, the irreversible loss of respiration. Mm -hmm. Um, and like my area of work is in the microbiome, so I'm, I look a lot at bacteria. And in um, Parkinson's disease, I think these similar mechanisms are going on where you're getting this mm. use of glucose for the, the brain versus ketones. Mm. Um, there's a paper from back in the 1940s that showed that the pur purple sulfur bacteria, which are kind of the precursors to the mitochondria, mm -hmm. if they're grown on glucose versus amino acids, all subsequent generations lose their photosynthetic ability. So mm -hmm. when he says the irreversible loss of respiration, my question is, is are, are we really able to reverse those daughter generations of mitochondria uh, back to um, being able to burn different sources of fuel or, mm. you know, is it irreversible? So yeah. um, that's I, part of the question. And the other question is this lactate because mm. my husband has Parkinson's, which is how I got into this field. Mm -hmm. And when his Parkinson's is causing problems with his walking, he was a marathon runner. Mm -hmm. Very bad for you. Um, I agree. And it feels like lactate buildup in his body. Mm -hmm. So that is what's going mm -hmm. on. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, the body is pretty efficient at getting rid of the lactate. Like, the mm -hmm. lactate is, is causing the muscle burn, but it's not causing the soreness, you know, so that the soreness is caused by physical damage to the muscle. The body's pretty good at getting rid of it, but it may be that there's, you know, he's, he's created these mechanisms that kind of keep him burning more glucose and making more lactate. And then, um, as far as irreversible, I don't know what him, made him say that. Um, I mean, that was, he wrote that a long time ago. Um, I, I tend to think that, you know, maybe it is irreversible, um, but, you know, the body is always, you know, attacking cancer yeah. cells, killing them, getting rid of them. The trick is not making new ones, right? So if you want to correct your metabolism, correct your metabolism so all your other cells are um, uh, not becoming cancerous, all the new cells that are created, and let your body deal with the ones that have already become cancerous, get rid of those, but correct your metabolism for the future cells. And then maybe some of those cancer cells do reverse themselves and go back. Um, I, don't, I don't know the answer for sure. Okay. Yeah. All right. um, patients that have stents, is the, that the point of no return in a sense, or would uh, the procedure help you know, so, with the fatty acids? And um, so I have a stent in myself. Um, and that's because it was an acute situation where the artery was completely blocked. I was about to die. That's the thing that saved my life. However, when you look at the research on elective stents, so they go in to do an angiogram just to investigate the arteries of the heart, and they say, oh, that's, that's pretty blocked. We're going to go in and put a stent. When you look at those procedures and whether or not they prevent heart attacks, um, they don't. Um, doing that procedure doesn't. And the reason is it's because of the collateral arteries. Right, they're already there. They've already created more blood flow around it. It's the reason that bypass surgeries, you look at the studies on those, like doing bypass surgeries doesn't prevent future heart attacks because the body's already done it. It's already created those collaterals as long as it's happened slow enough that it can create them. So elective stents, and uh, Dr. Asim Maholtra, um, a cardiologist in the UK, talks about this a lot. Elective stent procedures don't save lives. Um, and bypass surgeries don't seem to be saving lives. And, that could be more or less because they just go and put the stent, they do the surgery, they don't give them any lifestyle advice, you know, or it could be that that's not really the solution because the blood flow has already been compensated. So, so basically, to get it, to, you know, to reduce the lactic acid, it would be good still to do the program. So what now? It would still be beneficial of what you're talking oh, about. Oh, yeah, to do this yes. type of stuff. Yeah, yeah, so definitely. It would oh, yeah, maybe yeah you're, definitely, you're definitely not, you know, there's, there's definitely not no hope. Yeah. Okay, that's yeah. good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you so much for your presentation. We yeah. really appreciate that. Yeah. Um, you're talking about oxidative stress and free radical pathology. I didn't notice that you mentioned anything about um, antioxidant protection from fruit and vegetable nutrition. Mm -hmm. What is your position on that? Yeah, I, I think that, I don't know, I think the jury's out for me whether or not external antioxidants are actually having that much benefit. I, I, I'm, I'm comfortable saying I don't know the answer, but I'm, you know, people are convinced that it does. Um, because when you study that in a, in a petri dish somewhere, you can put that, um, uh, that fruit or vegetable antioxidant, whatever it may be, into that, and it seems to neutralize free radicals or something like that, however they do the studies. But when you look at studies that actually compare and these are imperfect studies, but if you look at studies that compare people who eat more fruits and vegetables, get more antioxidants in their diet, some studies use green tea, some people studies use other things, um, it didn't really have an effect on them. But that's just one variable. Who's to say that they weren't also exposing themselves to some toxin that was creating oxidative stress? I don't know. I think the jury's out. I think the really heavy hitter for antioxidants is, is internal antioxidants that your body's making. And the way you upregulate those is hormetic stresses, so exercise, um, you know, lower carb, whole food diets, um, hot cold therapy, things like that. Those hormetic stresses that kind of stress your body into um, making or uh, having a response that results in kind of a net positive as far as antioxidant production, but also um, supporting your liver in ways that help it create um, uh, antioxidants like, like collagen protein, like the amino acids specific in collagen protein um, are, are that are higher in collagen protein. Uh, are what a lot of antioxidants that your liver makes are made of, and so providing or that. And there's studies, that, at least in rats anyways, that show that collagen protein consumption increases internal antioxidant production. Those are the ones that are really going to help us. Um, but also, you know, enough sulfur. I know that uh, Stephanie Sinef talks about sulfur a lot. That's really important because, uh, you know, those um, antioxidants are, are sulfur-bearing, using a sulfur-bearing amino acids, um, so that kind of stuff. Uh, I think is more important than trying to jam down a bunch of antioxidants uh, in the form of supplements or, or fruits and vegetables and things like that. So do you think the jury's still out? I think so. And I'm not ready to say one way or the other. Nutrition could be helpful in reducing oxidative could stress, be. or it may not be, but you're not aware of the studies that are out there that show that. Uh, yeah, or at least not in a way, or not done in a way that I would say, yes, mm -hmm. that's def definitely having an effect. Okay. Um, but I would say I'm in the middle, you right. know, which I guess Thank most you. studies include that way anyways. More research is needed, right? Thank you. Hello. Thank you for your presentation. Yep. Um, it's real quick. What is the most heart-healthy meal at McDonald's? <laughs> uh, ask, for, ask for just burger patties and ask them to cook it in not vegetable oil. I was just kidding. Um, you recommended uh, moderating fructose. And I know that that's kind of a different people in the metabolic sphere have conflicting opinions on that. So what would constitute a moderate fructose intake and what are the pros and cons of eliminating it completely? Um, well, fructose is interesting. Um, I, I, I tend to look at things from an evolutionary perspective and, and fructose was available one time a year um, for the most part and that was when fruit was in season. Um, I guess you could find some honey too, but uh, so I'd say seasonal fruit is probably the best way to moderate your fructose consumption. Only eat seasonal fruit, um, and that's probably you know that's probably um, the most reasonable, I guess, way or way to think about it. But then you know the problem is not fructose itself; it's the excessive amount of fructose. You know, the high fructose corn syrup and every, it's everywhere. But fructose is interesting because it doesn't, you know, require, um, as far as I know, you know, insulin to, be, to get into the cell. It can go directly into it, um, which is an issue. And we want to we wanna burn more fatty acids and ketones, just, you know, letting a substance that's going to prevent that directly into the cell um, is, is a problem, which is why we're not necessarily set up to process so much glu or fructose. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, did that, that answer everything? Is that all the aspects of your question? That's good enough. Thank you. Okay. Um, real quick, I'm not sure if this relates to the heart, but it probably does. Um, could you say a few words about why long distance running is not a good thing, in your opinion? 
Yeah, in my opinion, I, I'm not going to take that away from anybody. Like, I'm not going to say, no, you can't do it. I mean, obviously, I can't do that anyways, but I'm not going to, like, if it gives you some type of benefit, like, whether it's mental or it's your career or something like that, like, I'm not going to say, don't do it. But there is evidence of, you know, people having cardiac events, running marathons and doing intense exercise and things like that. And there's, there's a lot of evidence that shows that clotting, um, increased clotting happens during intense exercise, like really intense exercise. And so um, I, I don't think that, my message is, if you want to get healthy, you don't have to run marathons. You don't even have to run more than three miles or so. Um, so w people think, you know, this, this couch to 5K and this couch to marathon thing, I don't think that's healthy. Um, I think that if you're if you have the certain set of genes that allows you to do that and you're a professional marathon runner, then yeah, I'm not going to say you can't do that. But um, I think, and I talk about in my book how um, this cardio, this endurance cardio, I should say, um, create, can create imbalances. And the three imbalances I talk about that I think drive heart disease, which I talked about here. Um, there's evidence that it depletes um, or uh, it creates oxidative stress, um, it creates insulin resistance, or it can, um, and it definitely stresses our body to the point where it can create an imbalance in the autonomic nervous system. Um, so it's just, the point is it's not necessary. People are like, oh, I'm going to run a marathon, we're going to do it as a team, and it's just like this event. It's like, well, you don't need to do that to be healthy. Um, it's not required. And resistance exercise, I think, is way better. So, yeah. Uh, you mentioned that the heart has 5,000 times more EMF frequencies than the brain. With the current situation out there with EMF, with 5G becoming indigenous all over the place, mm -hmm. what is your future prognosis of brain, uh, heart health, rather? Uh, I mean, yeah, it's concerning. Uh, like, the study I showed up there, like, the, the EMFs, and that, that was way before 5G rolled out, that study. So I don't know, like, the, the, like 25 times stronger with 5G could be, you know, completely affecting the heart in a, in a much bigger way. Um, so I, I don't know, but I, I'm worried about it, I'll say that, you know, um, especially the closer you are to, to 5G. I think I saw a tower right over there, so <laughs> not to scare anybody. But, yeah. I, I got the clear uh, impression that to reduce lactate consumption and promote more oxygen-based metabolism, you favor more fat, and I didn't get a clear idea of how much you value protein and carbohydrate in that equation. There's a saying in biochemistry that fat burns in the flame of carbohydrate because carbohydrate provides pyruvate, which makes oxaloacetate, which allows the, fat, the ketone bodies to be burned in the citric acid cycle. You could also get that from protein. Mm -hmm. um, but if you're missing carbohydrate and nitrogen from protein, or you're just missing proteins, like suppose someone only ate fat, they would be limited both in the ability to oxidize ketones because of the citric acid cycle, but also the malate aspartate shuttle would not be able to carry electrons from the cytosol of the mitochondria, which would actually make you make more lactate mm -hmm. um, in order to allow glycolysis to run. So could you comment on the balance between ketones and the carbohydrate yeah. and protein that you would need to make you oxidize them for energy without lactate? Yeah, I mean, as far as like, everybody get that? <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so in the talk, it may have sounded like only burn ketones and fatty acids, when in reality, we should always be burning multiple fuel, source, uh, fuel sources, um, and the heart's always doing that. It just seems to prefer more fatty acids and ketones than, than other tissues. Um, but it's always supposed to be burning all three, and I think there's a reason for that, because like Chris was saying, there are things that... Um, the, the cell needs, the metabolism needs from, from burning a glucose or having glucose present um, that facilitate the whole system. So it's about, you know, I like the term metabolic flexibility. You know, I don't like, the, like being diehard keto one way or 70% of your calories from fat. I mean, that can be therapeutic in some individuals, um, but it's metabolic flexibility is the real important thing. It's the ability to go readily back and forth from burning carbohydrates, proteins, fats, whatever your cell needs to. And it's not training your body to be stuck in one. And so lots of people today have trained their body to burn carbohydrates because there's this thing called oxidative priority that your, lots of tissues in your body are going to burn carbohydrates first if they're always present, or alcohol first, really, and then um, carbohydrates. Um, and so if we're always putting tons of processed carbs in there, then it, it never really gets the chance to, to do, use those mechanisms to burn 
proteins, fatty acids, and, and times that it needs to. Um, and so it's, it's about eating in a way that creates that metabolic flexibility. And, you know, I found that, you know, wash resistance diet is, is one of those diets. There's lots of different diets that create metabolic flexibility, but that's one of them. And, you know, in the keto crowd, everybody talks about, like, oh, keto is the greatest. But that's a true ketogenic diet is 70% or more of your calories from fats. And I, I have clients all the time that, you know, they may do that for a while, um, but I have clients all the time that, you know, have a decent amount of carbohydrate at their meal and they wake up the next morning after a decent fast and they have ketones around. So, you know, having ketones around is, is going to happen um, whether or not we're on a ketogenic diet or not. It's about maintaining that metabolic flexibility. So, hope that made sense. Um, a couple of questions, but they should be quick. What was that diet that you mentioned that kind of helps to create metabolic flexibility in a person? Uh, I mean, there's lots of different diets that, that will do that. Okay. Um, uh, the Wise Traditions diet. Wise Traditions. Yeah, yeah, sorry. <laughs> All right, and then yeah. <laughs> the other question, um, I guess you kind of covered, I'm sorry, I didn't, I was late here, so no I got to buy your book now, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but the, the flour gap, or I was going to ask about the flour versus gaps diet, but I think you kind of touched on it, like you want metabolic flexibility, that's your position on that. Yeah. Uh, and I understand that. Um, and then uh, I was going to ask, um, you, you seem to touch on a lot of like fitness stuff, so that's really interesting because um, I used to do a lot of that, not so much anymore, but what do you think about um, just, you know, uh, reasonable amounts of like cardio, like a run or a walk, yeah. jog, just to, do you no. think that does help the heart? Like, Definitely beneficial, yeah, yeah. Um, as far as like, you know, creating the balance and the three imbalances I talked about, yeah. Um, I'd say no, you don't really have to do more than three to five miles of cardio, technically, you know. Uh, whether that could be walking, it could be running, it could be whatever it needs to be, yeah. Uh, so, yeah. All right, thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Hussey. Thank you.